this is a talk on Ceylon banknotes from 1785 to 1884. Uh, its content is basically the website notes.laktiva.org. Uh, Sri Lanka is a small island in the middle of the Indian Ocean and was an important point in the ancient maritime silk route between China and Europe. This is a photograph of the island from space in 1966. The word Lakdiva is actually means Lanka Island. And uh, it is the name that I use from a website, which is an ancient name for Sri Lanka. The ancient coins of uh, Sri Lanka were found uh, from for the fourth century BCE. And in the Kautilya's Arthashastra, which is a big document which talks about uh, administration of the time, it says that coins could be made of wood, lacquer, gum, seed, fruit, etc., and even palmera leaf, which is equivalent to paper. So in a way, we must have had old paper currency uh, in the ancient times, but none of them have survived. There was a lot of banking in ancient Lanka. Kautilya Rathashastra talks about uh, five, uh, debt, uh, debt and loans and interest and whatever. A lot of stone inscriptions talk about that as well. So there was a fairly well-established banking system in ancient Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka was known as Celio from 1505 to 1658, Ceylon during the Dutch period, and Ceylon during the British period, and since independence in 1948 as Sri Lanka. So the Laktiva collection, I'm, what I'm trying, is a small, Lanka being a small country, unlike India, it is possible to actually try to create a website which records all the notes and coins and banknotes of the country. This will be impossible, I think, uh, in countries like India, uh, which, has, which is so large compared to Sri Lanka. But uh, here in Sri Lanka, I think it is manageable, and I have tried to do that in my two websites. Uh, the notes, uh, the, the note, the, um, but most of the notes in this uh, talk is not from my Laktiva collection because this is older than the notes that I possess. Most of them came from an auction in London, 2011, April 14th. This is, I can't call it an auction. The auction catalog was is quite interesting, but the auction was one of the Freya Spinks auctions, which was never held. So I don't know what happened to this collection, but it's a pity, but the pictures that came from the auction catalog has been a big boost for me to create this website. The first issues of uh, modern notes in Sri Lanka were issued in 1785 by Governor Van de Graaff, who took over Ceylon from Governor Falk. And he found that he didn't have enough paper money to pay the troops. And in 1785, March 19th, he decided to issue Ceylon's first paper money. This, I don't have any notes from 1785 to 1794. I mean, I presume they look like this, which was issued in 1794, which is the oldest known note. Uh, it's a thousand rich dollar note. Uh, it is published in a book by B.W. Fernando, and I sort of got the picture from the book. I don't know where this particular note exists. In about 19, 2017, this uh, note, which is a five rich dollar, a five free, uh, rich dollar credit brief note, was issued and was listed in a Sphinx auction for 19,000 pounds. It didn't sell. Uh, it was the first note that I have seen, and uh, the Sphinx was kind enough to send me a high resolution image of it, which I have used on my website. It has payments uh, or interest payments. I will talk about that later. 
recorded all the way up to 1912. What is interesting in this is that the legality of the state of the note was given in Dutch here, in Sinhalese, and in Tamil. So the full legality statement was in all three languages in use at the time. I have tried in my website to put all that tests in Sinhalese, Tamil, and Dutch so that it is properly indexed on my web page. And I uh, write through the notes.lakteva.org. I put all the text that appears in Tamil and Sinhala as well on the website. In 1795, uh, December 18, there was a decision to issue smaller denomination uh, rix dollar notes from one to 10 rix dollars. And these notes were issued uh, by the government just before actually, I dated 1st of January, just before the British took over the island. At that time, there was a statement that the British uh, are taking over and therefore a lot of people didn't trust the uh, credit driven because they didn't know whether it will cease to be useful after the British took over. So this is a two rix dollar uh, note uh, from uh, that period. Uh, this particular note has two logos stamped on the four corners of the note, a printed note with signatures, and the back was blank with the date Colombo, uh, January, 1st January 1796. These two logos are interesting because they appear on a coin that was issued in 1782. On one side, there is the logo for Colombo, which was a dove on a mango tree. And on the other side is the VOC logo with C on top. So these notes were issued in Colombo. Uh, there is the one brick dollar. And at the back of the note, after the British took over on 15th of February, 1796, the British agreed to pay 3% interest on these notes for a, max, a maximum of 50,000 pounds. And therefore, they were endorsed at the back with the signature of Geo Gregory, who was the collector for, and a seal at the middle. I always didn't know what this seal was till I decided to try to decipher it. And I found out that this seal has Colonel Stuart written on top, not very legible, but I think it can be deciphered. It has Colonel Stuart written in Persian Nastalik text in the middle, 1796 written in Persian, which is quite readable. And Colonel James Stewart in 1796 led the British troops to take Ceylon from the Dutch. So his uh, personal seal has been used on the back of the currency notes when Britain decided to pay 3% interest on those 50,000 uh, uh, pounds worth of rix dollars. This was the three rix dollar note. This is also from the collection of the Colombo National Museum. I am not sure where else it is available. Here's the four rix dollar note, and the five rix dollar note, and the 10 rix dollar note. So these are the notes issued during the Dutch period before the British took over the island. So when the British took over the island in middle of February, 1796, it was taken over by the British East India Company and it became part of the Madras presidency. The, by peace of Amiens, the possession of Ceylon was confirmed to the British. On January 1802, the, it became a crown colony under Britain. 
India, which consists of consisted at that time of 500 princely states, is now a union of 28 states. India became a crown colony only in 1859, six decades after Ceylon in 1802. This may be the only reason Ceylon is not a state of India like Tasmania is in Australia. And as that has always fascinated me because that defines the identity independent of India, because India had so many countries which were combined. And this 1803 cartoon from the British Museum illustrates this reason why Ceylon was favored. And I think it's a very interesting cartoon because it shows a star of Ceylon rising in the east and on the rays are written wealth, pensions, places, government, uh, rewards, honors, and a lot of other things. And it says, courage, my good friends, I perceive a ray of hope that we may save our, my country. I don't know who these politicians are. Maybe some of you may be able to recognize these politicians from 1803. But I found this particular drawing very interesting to say why Ceylon was made a crown colony in 1802, unlike India, which only became a crown colony in 1859. Okay, now to get to the main uh, topic of uh, discussion, which are the notes. The first note I have is of 1806. It is a fairly simply printed note. I didn't even know of this existence. I found it on the internet a few years ago when I was making my website. It was printed by the Dutch press in Colombo Fort, which was established in 1734 and taken over by the British in 1796. Even though the name is not written, I have been told by experts that from the font, they can. Uh, it was definitely done by the Dutch press, which is also the, similar to the font which was used to print the uh, credit driven notes, credit uh, cash note uh, notes. So this is a note which is pretty rare. I have not seen any others of that period. The next note is was issued in 1809. And by then they decided to print the notes in England. So this particular note was printed by Gill and Butler engravers of London. It's a hundred Rix dollar note, and it has the value in Sinhalese here and Tamil there, uh, Pataga CAI, uh, which has, from the angle, I think these were hand stamped and not actually printed with the note probably they have not figured out how to print. But what is interesting of this note, the, it says it promises to pay the bearer on demand the sum of 100 rich dollars in copper. So I worked out how much of copper would 100 rich dollars be, and it works out to be 43 and a half kilograms. I wonder how many 100 rich dollar notes were converted into copper. They have taken quite an effort to take it away from the bank. It has uh, this logo uh, of Britannia with Gale Butler engravers London written on the bottom. This was impossible to read in the auction listing. I was lucky to find the owner and he sent me a high resolution image which from which I found out who the printer was. In 1814, the printer has changed uh, to Sylvester S uh, ST27 Strand, uh, London. Uh, and uh, this was the logo. It's slightly different from the previous logo. So I guess each printer made his own logo. Uh, so this was 1814 note. Now here we have in addition to the name of the bank, uh, sorry, in addition to the value in Sinhala and Tamil, the bank that issued it, which is the government of uh, Ceylon, has been printed, Lanka Andua has been uh, also hand stamped on the side in Sinhala and Tamil. 
So this note is slightly different in structure and printed by a different printer, but still the Sinhala and Tamil has been hand stamped on it. This should be strand, I think. I sorry, I missed. I didn't need a stand. Um, the 1820 Rix dollar, also printed by them. Again, I was quite surprised that the Britannia is slightly different from what was used in 1814. This uh, note, uh, five rich dollar note, I got it from the British Museum collection, now has the words Lanka, uh, Ceylon uh, government in Singhala and Tamil printed with also the value uh, five uh, above and below in Tamil. So these were the first printed notes with uh, the language printed on rather than being rubber stamped. Uh, in 1820, I think they were forged and therefore there was a regulation that they also needed a uh, dry stamp on it to authenticate the real ones from the forgeries. So this dry stamp with Ceylon government written on it was stamped and you get the same note here it's a two rich dollar note and it includes the dry stamps on the side this is from the Kalambo national museum collection okay so that is the end of the rich dollars and in 1825 the british government decided that we were going into uh pound sterlings and i think it's a common decision that happened all across the colonies uh, this is a one pound note it's a proof it doesn't have the singular and tamil and there is the two pound note also a proof from that auction but i've been unable to get any other notes of these uh, of this series i think there are uh, this is the engraving from the five pound note, which was published by Virginia Hewitt in an article he wrote, she wrote into a, in the British Numismatic Journal. And she was questioning why a Ceylon note should have two camels because camels are unknown in the wild in Sri Lanka. So maybe the person who did the engraving for Ceylon did not know that fact and included camels in the engraving. If I, I would love to get specimens of these, the um, British Museum does not have, but if you know anybody who does have these notes, I would be very happy if you could put me in touch so that I can get images. That's the only bit I have not been able to get. Okay, then in 1850, uh, there was another issue, a second issue of notes, and I think these notes did go up all the way up to 50 pounds, but the one, two, and five pound notes, a fairly large stock of remainders were found early last century, and these no the remainders are now available among most of the collectors. It's the only a set of notes that I have, which belong to that era. They are remainders with no signatures, but um, uh, quite a few are known among uh, us collectors. So the set has three notes, the one pound, the two pounds, and the five pound notes, and often seen on auction as well. The engraving here is quite pretty. It has an elephant, the Britannia with the British lion, and a sailing ship and a steamer on the other side. And the rest of the thing, I think this, this particular engraving is unique to Sri Lanka, a Ceylon. It was printed by Perkins, Bacon and Pitch of London. Another thing interesting, since I have the notes with me, I could look at the watermarks. And the watermarks are interesting because I was quite surprised to find that the N was upside down in the one pound. N was upside down. 
I was not sure. I have looked at other notes and the N is right way in those notes. So I presume the watermarks were not all made with the same thing and it, somebody made a mistake when they laid out the water, uh, watermark, whatever was used to make the watermark in, for this particular note. The two pounds and the five pounds also do not have that error that I found in the one pound. So it must, that must be just an error and uh, it's quite interesting. Okay, now I go on to the major section of the thing and it's about the commercial private banks which issued notes in this same period. Um, the authorization to issue notes was given in 1844 and private banks were allowed to issue notes as long as they were more than one pound. I think that was later changed to 10 shillings. And what I want to emphasize is that only private bank notes were legal tender from in Ceylon for the 29 years from 1856 to the end of 1884. Those three notes that I showed previously, issued by the government treasury, were demonetized in 1856. So after that, we didn't have any government notes legal tender in the country. So ignoring uh, the dates of issue, which were mostly handwritten till about 1870, I have counted 96 banknote types that are rec recognized from these private banks. Only 56 of them are cataloged in the Crow's standard catalog of paper money, specialized issue, and many of them are only proofs without the colored over stamps as seen in the Mercantile Bank of India, London, and China. None of them are included in the bank notebook. Uh, I basically do, uh, do not understand why this is because the same banks in the mid 19th century, for example, in Hong Kong, Australia, uh, Malaya, etc., are uh, listed as regular issues in the standard catalog of world paper money and the bank notebook. So, uh, this is a plea actually. I'm hoping that Owen will agree that these notes, which I have documented, should come in as a part of the regular bank notes of uh, Ceylon. And the, one of the reasons for me wanting to give this talk, emphasizing these notes, is to try to get to, that to happen. They are not specialized notes. The first bank to open was the Bank of Ceylon. Uh, it uh, issued notes from one pound to 50 pounds. And these notes were part of that auction. This was the one pound. It has a logo uh, which uh, uh, with Perkins Bacon and Petch London. And again, we have this camel at the back. So I don't think we had any camels even during that time. And so it also is an interesting mistake, which was pointed out by Virginia Hewitt in her article. It says, uh, the text says that the bearer will be permitted uh, given currency of the island, not copper. So we have changed from promising copper to promising uh, other currency notes and would have been government treasury notes, I presume, at the time. And it was signed by the director and the manager. And the values were printed in Sinhala and Tamil as well. It's very designed, very similar to the government uh, notes of the year of that time. Ten pounds, uh, twenty pounds, fifty pounds. And uh, those were the ones actually listed in that auction. I was trying to actually find the sizes of these notes, and I was lucky to find a two pounds in the British Museum. And thankfully to Thomas Hockner, 
he actually scanned and sent me the image of this uh, note. And so I have two pounds, which is unlisted actually in the Strauss catalog. I would very much like to get a watermark image of this, but it's supposed to say Ceylon currency two pounds, but I have not been able to get a water pound image from the British mu Museum. This is the note, the two pound note. Unlike the others, it has a serial number, which may have said that it may have been used, or this was not issued, it's not signed, but the fact that it may have been prepared for usage at some point. It has the lion and the unicorn uh, as the logo in the middle. Okay, so there were several other banks that issued currency for Ceylon during that time. The Asiatic Banking Corporation of Colombo and Candy, that was a very short-lived bank. It was founded in 1864 and after a brief existence was liquidated in 1866. So this is the 10 shilling note. So I guess at that time they have got permission to issue 10 shilling as well. Uh, the one pound note, the five pound note, and the 10 pound note. So then those were all Uniface, they were all printed by Smith, Elder and Co. Engravers of London. Probably in 1865, for whatever reason, they decided to issue notes which were printed on both sides. And this 10 shilling note, which has a slightly different design, has a fairly elaborate back to it. And this was issued both in Colombo and Candy. This, the top one is Colombo. And also there was a Colombo, there was a one pound note, also with an elaborate design at the back. I think this is only a specimen. I don't see, I have not never seen an issued note of this phenomenon, of this type. The watermark is interesting. It has Asian banking, Corporation and uh, some logos in the middle, some uh, symbols in the middle, and maybe a 10 in the middle. It's very difficult to actually get, get this information from photographs without the banknote in hand. So that's the uh, notes from the um, mercantile thing. The next bank to issue notes is the Mercantile Bank. That was formed in 1853 as the Mercantile Bank of Bombay, founded in India. It opened a branch in 1854. In 1857, they renamed the bank, the Mercantile Bank of India, London, and China. So I, interestingly, it has a note before it got chartered. So this says Mercantile Bank of India, London and China issued the Colombo note issued at Candy. The only note I have seen like this and was sold in that auction. It's five shillings. It was printed by Bato and Co. London. Uh, the engraving is also pretty elaborate. But I have seen this engraving used in notes of Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, so I don't think this is unique to uh, Sri uh, Ceylon. It promises to pay bearer on demand in the branch in Colombo in the currency of the island. So there was a branch in Colombo and Candy and a gold branch was opened in 1863. Now these notes were are very rare and I, they are not cataloged in Krauss because I think the only collection was available with the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank Corporation in London archives. 
And what I'm showing you, I was able to get from them after a lot of persuasion. And I have published this article in the IBNS journal about these notes because these notes have not been seen before. Uh, so this is the five shilling, and this is after getting chartered, the chartered mercantile, they added the word chartered on top, and the rest of the design is the same, and it's also still uh, by the order of the directors, normally that changes after charter, but this note was a quick print type with you. Um, the 10 shilling note, uh, again, uh, Ceylon branch on top, 10 shillings, it has a back also, um, an elaborate uh, design on the back, and a 10 shilling note, this is also from the HSBC archive. Then there were from 1864 to 1869, 10 shillings, 1 pound, 5 pounds, and 10, uh, 10 pounds and 50 pounds issued in Colombo. Uh, 10 shillings, 1 pound, and 5 pounds issued in Candy. I presume they are all that were issued because the HSBC didn't have any of the other denominations or cities. So the logo was again the land and the unicorn. Uh, chartered mercantile, and it was um, could be got or um, from uh, bay on demand only at the particular city in which the uh, currency was issued. So these notes, if they were issued in Candy, had to be uh, recovered back in Candy itself. This was the ten shilling note. It had a design at the back. There is no five shilling of this series from 1864. The one pound specimen, this is the Colombo note. Uh, the five pound, I'm not sure where this, uh, this five or this overprint is not seen in most of the specimens that are listed in catalogs. And I think it may have been a hand stamp, I'm not sure, but it definitely is uh, not there in the proofs that are seen of these notes, which was what was available before I got these notes from the HSBC archive. Another interesting thing I discovered in these notes was there was an error in the printing of the Singhala. It should have been Panahai, which is 50, and instead it had been printed as Pakahai, which is a bit of filth. So I think uh, some, this was quite surprising to see this uh, in the note. Uh, the 10 pounds also like that. And in the 10 pound note, also the Eka CII had been written as Wakai Pai, which I think is quite surprising. Uh, so I have a feeling that this was a disgruntled uh, bank employer who decided to have some fun against the British uh, English management of the bank. Uh, both these mistakes were corrected when the coin and notes were reissued in 1870 when Ceylon became decimal and the currency notes changed from pounds to rupees. So this is a bit of interesting thing to see Singhala's obscene slang written on currency notes which were in circulation. This is the 50 pounds, that the writing is okay. And then in 1870, we adopted decimal currency, rupees and cents, a hundred years before England, even though we were a British Commonwealth country, or a British colony actually at that time. So when the notes, uh, the currency was, uh, the decimal currency was adopted in 1870, these notes issued in 1870, 1873, 1877, and 1880, have now the denominations written in rupees. Here, the uh, note was uh, uh, renewable on demand at the branch, which could be Candy or Gaul, or in Colombo. 
So here was the five pounds, uh, five rupees, which would have been equivalent to the 10 shillings. And same design, except for the value written in um, value written in rupees rather than pounds. 10 pounds, the colors will remain the same as before for the same value. 50 pounds, here you can write, see that the name has been written pro uh, properly in Sinhalese. 100 pounds, this is an issued note for Gaul of 1880 and has the signatures and the overprint. 500 rupees, which should have been uh, 50, uh, 50, uh, yeah, 50 pounds. And uh, also the 1,000 rupees, which should have been 100 pounds. So all of them have a different logo at the back. Uh, it has a watermark, chartered mercantile, I presume it has bank in the middle of India, London, and China. Unfortunately, by a small error, this particular image did not appear in the IBNS journal, and it got replaced by the figure 14 and the 15 are the same. But uh, this particular watermark is visible on the higher denomination notes after 1870. I have to thank Claire Twin of the Global Functions Archives and manager of HSBC Holdings PLC for actually sending me those notes. And I think it's these notes, images after it came out of HSBC, are the first time any of us were able to see any of these notes. I have seen black and white specimens of these notes in the central bank, but the color ones were the first time I got into the archive and got permission to reproduce them here as well as publish them in the IBNS journal. So this, um, this issue, current issue from page 40 to 48 has an article with, the, uh, with these, all these notes put in there, except for the watermark image, which has mysteriously disappeared. Okay. The Oriental Bank uh, was the other bank that was founded as the West um, Bank of Western India in 1842. In 1846, it became the Oriental Bank and had branch in Ceylon. And in 1849, it took over the failed bank, Bank of Ceylon. So that's where the Bank of Ceylon did not, may have not even issued notes because it was taken over five years after it was formed. And in 1851, when it got Royal Charter, it became the Oriental Bank Corporation. So these are the notes uh, when it was the Oriental Bank issued in 1846, issued in Colombo. There is the 10 shillings, which has this logo of the unicorn and the lion, Batho and Bingley, London. It has the one pound. And if you notice that it has the time value in both uh, single, in the single is it has the uh, value in pounds and uh, value in written in Tamil and in single is on the sides. And the printer's name here Till uh, it was sort of, uh, it had not got chartered, so it was board of directors again. The five pounds, same design, and the 10 pounds. Uh, I've not seen any other denominations. Okay. In 1854, it issued a note with the denomination of five rupees. Now, this is long before we adopted uh, rupees and cents, which was in 1870. So the, the Oriental Bank decided that they would deal with uh, five uh, rupees rather than issue the notes in pounds, uh, basically because 
Indian rupees were, were circulated among most people as currency. So the public were more knowing uh, about rupees than they knew about pounds. And therefore, this bank had decided to issue their currency. And in the text, it says, uh, I will read the text later. This is the logo, slightly different from the previous uh, the other logo with the lion and the unicorn. And in the text, it says, promise to pay bearer on demand the sum of 10, 10 rupees or the equivalent currency in the, uh, of, the, of this island. So it basically says, if you bring this note, I will pay you in rupees, 10 rupees, or in pounds if you so require. So these notes were issued in Colombo in this case, 10 rupees, uh, 50 rupee note uh, issued in Colombo again, and the Oriental Bank, here the logo. And these notes, you occasionally find torn, similar to what was uh, mentioned previously in the last talk about Indian notes, that people used to tear these notes into to send it by post one half at a time for security purposes. So a lot of the Ceylon notes also of this era are uh, found to, torn into, particularly the higher denominations. The hundred, the uh, specimen, and the thousand. I think these were all uniface. I have not seen the back of it. Okay. Uh, very interestingly, in from 1864, we had more branches open. And this is a note issued in Badulla rather than, you know, Colombo, Candy, and Gaul are well known to most people. This is tea country, and a note is issued in Badulla in 1864. Uh, in Jaffna, a 10 rupee note. Here, five and a 10 were issued, but I'm showing only the 10. Candy, this is a five rupee note that also has been torn into. Gaul, 1866. And Haldumullah, this was the most surprising of the cities. Must have been a major center in the tea growing time, uh, 1870. Because 10 years ago, when I went to Haldi Muller, there was not even an ATM. And we had to go to a nearby thing to get an ATM. But during the British era, it would have been a major center which had uh, notes issued in their name. The watermark of this note has Oriental Bank Corporation written at the back darker than the background. Then in 1877, we have notes issued here by Colombo. It had a back, low uh, spirographic back. I think in the mid 1870s, these designs would have been introduced into the currency notes. 10 rupees also with the back. And the 100 rupees, now this is actually cataloged. And uh, quite interestingly, it has a very non-local background to it of Poseidon. And this was published from the British Mu Museum collection by Virginia Hewitt. And uh, it is by the painter Asmuk, A-R-A-D-M-L. And it has this logo. I'm not sure whether the same engraving was used in for other countries, but it's interesting to find it here on the 100 rupee note. I'm not sure what is in on the 50 rupee note. Uh, in 1881, the printing changed to Bradbury Wilkinson's of London, 
and the design of the notes also changed significantly. And here is a note of Nuarelia. Actually, Haldemulla drops from the issuing notes, and instead we get Nuarelia, which is the biggest town issuing the notes from 1881. These were the last years of the um, issue of these notes. There was the 10 rupee here in Badulla and uh, elaborate back. All these notes had Queen Victoria on one side on a throne with two lions on the two sides and Mercury with the Caduceus on the right, printed by them. This particular design was used in Australia, Hong Kong as well, I think, and some other countries. So it was a common design used by Badbury Wilkinson to print notes for the colonies. Here are 10 rupees of Jaffna candy, a used note. Gaul, Palambo, 100 rupees. So, and these also had the same kind of watermark, which is Oriental Banking Corporation. So we had many no notes which were printed in the now our current day all notes are issued they don't even tell Colombo even though they are all issued in Colombo whereas in that period from 1785 to 1884 we have had in the initial stages of the rix dollar notes notes issued in Trincomalee and Batiklo none of which exist and during the British era we have got Jaffna, Colombo, Gaul, Candy, Nuarelia, Badulla, and Haldulmulla as cities which issued notes for usage. I have printed all of this in a, a catalog that I published and contributed to the IBN Book of the Year contest in 2019. And I was very happy that they gave me honorable mention for my effort of printing that book. Actually, all what is in that book is contained in the website as well, or more actually. So I will end my talk now and say that these are all these notes and more are available in the website notes.laktiva.org. And I hope to actually improve on it, get more notes. And the website does have notes all the way to 19 uh, current day uh, issues. And I hope uh, you all will visit the website because it has a lot more information than I was able to put in a one hour talk. Okay. I will now sh stop sharing, or shall I keep it on if anybody has questions? Thank you, thank you Kawan. I receive a couple of questions and a statement. Uh, so um, the, the statement uh, I think you mentioned in the Mercantile Bank, the guillosh with the face value, uh, it, you didn't know whether it was printed or stamped. Yes, yes. That one is printed. Palm is uh, pointing out that it's similar to some uh, Irish notes. Uh, so that part is actually printed on the bank note. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, but I was question... surprised that the printing was not available on the proofs. So it must have been a second stage. That's what got me wondering because none of the proofs have this printing. It's only the specimens that. Kevin, Kevin, I think you'll find that Jonathan will know a lot more about this. Um, because of his books on uh, Paper Money of Ireland and Paper Money of Scotland, he's come across many of these banknote types and proofs, so he might have more of an answer as well, especially the printers. Okay. Yes, that would be nice to know. The other questions, uh, uh, the first one is, uh, was the exchange rate for the rupees tied one to one with India? Yes. Up to 1917, it was one Indian rupee to one 
Sri Lankan rupee. In fact, somewhere around 1835, it was Indian, it was not Indian currency notes, it was Indian silver rupees that were actually used in Ceylon. Uh, and the Indian silver, because what happened in 1825, when the British uh, came and uh, converted to uh, pound shillings pence, the British used to send pound, uh, British silver to Ceylon. But because of the exchange rate, all of them used to get melted to make jewelry. So the British in 1835 said, no, we are not sending any more silver to you. You don't know how to look after them and you keep melting them, we can't send it. So from 1835, we unofficially used Indian silver coins in us. No British silver was ever circulating in Ceylon till um, 1852 when they made gold sovereigns legal tender, but that was too big a coin for us. So the Indian rupee was actually unofficial legal tender till 1870 and then made official legal tender when we became decimal currency. And then we issued our first uh, rupee note in 1917 when we broke away from the same standard. But I think the two notes went uh, equal in value all the way up to independence. So I think the values were practically the same. It was 10 rupees to the British pound. And it was about 15 rupees in 1900, but other than that, it was a standard exchange rate. All right. The second question, come on, put a nice photo of, uh, of a banknote instead of the black. Okay, uh, I'll share again, I think. Okay, I can. All right, all right. Um, the other question I have, uh, um, Jonathan is asking a, a little bit more elaboration on the RIX dollar. Uh, okay. Is it a coin? Is it an accounting unit? Uh, or if it's a coin, uh, what kind of metal and weight size was? It was a, it was a Dutch coin, the RIX dollar was a Dutch coin, which is actually the equivalent was the, uh, the dollar, which actually became the US dollar in England, in uh, dollar. The, those no coins are actually described a lot in my website on coins.laktiva.org. It was the standard unit of currency during the Dutch era. And it derived from the thing, the British, actually used it and in fact issued some coins in rix dollars as well uh, up to 1821 but then transformed in 1825. Okay. Are, you happy? are you happy with the answer i would love to have an discussion on it if there are <laughs> can uh, uh, can i can you hear me can i speak yes i can i can hear you yeah uh, come on hello thank you very much for a really very very interesting uh presentation um i um yes i, I was very interested about uh rick's dollar or reich's dollars because i mean it's a dutch word but it's also uh very similar to a german word and I think there were lots of silver coins that were around in, in Europe that used that, that were described in that way. And the reason I'm asking is because I have a picture, I don't have an image, I don't have the thing itself, of a bill of exchange, um, which was drawn in um, Edinburgh, in Scotland, and payable in uh, Hamburg, actually. And it was denominated in Rix dollars. So uh, when I was trying to research that, I came up with the information that it was sometimes just used as a description for, you know, a coin of roughly that the size of a, a, a British crown, and which is roughly the size of the uh, the Rix dollar coin that has been issued in uh, in Ceylon in Sri Lanka. Um, right. But it's it's quite difficult to pin down precisely. <laughs> what it was, and that's why I asked the question. Um, yeah, so it was you... the, the Dutch called it Reichs dollar, 
and yeah. the British converted it and uh, spelled it Rix dollar, which is mm. quite different from the Dutch. But we used to, the stewards, which was 48 stewards to the Rix dollar, became 48 stivers to the Rix dollar. Okay. Yeah, so it's quite interesting that it was used in a commercial transaction in Scotland, uh, you know, back in the uh, in the 60, you know, 1650 something. So, you know, it's obviously quite widely used uh, as a, I think mean, that was just a paper, that was a bill of exchange. It wasn't a, a coin or anything. Um, but it's, it's just, it's just interesting to me. Um, uh, Pam, Pam put me on the spot earlier, said that I was able to answer a question. And could you remind me what the question was? And I'll try. Yes, and whether it. those over stamps of five and colored over stamps are actually printed or hand stamped on the note. The reason I suspected it was hand stamped was because none of the specimen proofs that are on sale have that colored overprint. Yeah. So and it won't. Yeah. So that is why I'm wondering whether it was a hand stamp or a second printing, of course, but uh, why was the specimens not having it? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, maybe that stamp, was that stamp a, a tax stamp? You know, uh, Jonathan, uh, you know, Jonathan, stop you there. It's the, it's the different denominations that appear, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100,000. Yeah. But the thing is, proofs or original specimens, they wouldn't have wasted colour originally, in my opinion, no. and only, only when they've moved on and the, the bank or the treasury has agreed, then they'll show what it will look like, like that. There you go. Yeah. I'll get off yeah. now. Well, that, that's what I would call a, a specimen rather than a proof, because uh, it's probably printed on banknote paper, which is probably watermarked, whereas the proofs are usually on plain paper or even on card. Um, and, and those are prepared for the printer's own use, or in fact, for the printer to show the the bank. You know, this is what the thing will look like when we when we print it on banknote paper. Uh, and you know that. So sometimes the proofs are not the same as the issued notes because you know they make further changes to the design. Um, so so uh, you know, normally a proof would not be in colour. Pam's absolutely right. You know, proofs would normally just be printed in black or at least a single color. Um, and of course, a proof. See, right, these dots come in in black and white in the specimens, right? Then yeah. in the proofs, yeah, they yeah. don't come colored. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you see a proof printed in black of what you see on that note on the screen now, with, with the ten. That is that will be engraved on a different plate. And you yeah. sometimes see proofs, which is just the 10. And of course, then you don't know, you know, which note it belongs to. Um, so, you know, but that's, that's part of how the printers, you know, went through the process of preparing it and checking that the plates have got all the detail right and so on and so forth. Um, uh, uh, another uh, interesting image that you showed, uh, Kevin, one of the notes had a wonderful vignette of uh, Neptune and lots of seahorses. Yes. And I thought that was a lovely note. Um, and it reminded me, and I just checked in my uh, uh, catalogue, but um, there were two different banks on the Isle of Man that had notes with exactly the same uh, vignette. And I don't know, you know, I think you were showing one, you said it was actually the, um, uh, the, uh, the painting from which it came. Um, but you know, I, I, this was an uh, article that was published by Virginia Huit in the. Uh, but I think you know that 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 actual image, almost exactly that. Perhaps I don't think it's not got the cherub flying around in the background, but it's got the rest of it there. Um, it appears on two Isle of Man notes, so it, it would be interesting to see it being used um, on. Um, you know, one of one of uh, Ceylonese, Ceylonese notes as well. I think the previous image, you've got a picture of the note with that. Um, yes, this one the actually back. I have. There, there is this note which is uh, available on my website uh, from the British Museum collection, I think. Okay. Or, oh, you, yeah. And I have and sort of improved the quality by super Photoshop in the... I see. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because you, so you call it so Poseidon. Bad. 
you call yeah, him Poseidon in in in, uh, in the Scottish catalogue that we did. We we did have uh, a couple of notes from the Isle of Man because there was a Scottish bank that um, um, started issuing notes on the Isle of Man, and they used that image. Uh, but I called him Neptune. Um, I think Neptune might be the um, yeah. Uh, the the Roman name and Poseidon the Greek name, but I'm yes, sure I somebody. Think it's the same god. It's the same god of the sea. It's the same god of the sea, exactly. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. A guy that you never want to upset if you're out in a boat. Yeah, the this particular logo uh, vignette was used um, in 1846 on an Isle of Man commercial banking company design. And you're quite right. Yes, of course, no cherubs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they removed the cherub, and it was also on the Bank of Mona five pound note. Uh, Pam, the other one. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Of course, it's in Pam's catalogue of Isle of Man notes. Just so that we get a plug in for Pam's book. <laughs> hey, may I? Uh, make a statement at this point please sure um yes. uh, it, i attended the american banknote sale of uh, 1990 in new york city and um there was a, a long series of bank of british columbia notes which uh, were basically 1894 issues but th they had the color overprints or tints for the denomination as a, they were obviously separate plates and they were printed at separate times. And I, I had it in my collection for a number of years, um, the, um, the, the black and white proofs, uh, and then they had, some had tint printed on top of that in color so that you could determine the number. Okay. It harder to counterfeit the notes um, which seems to be a, a chief uh, occupation of a lot of people in North America. And uh, so you, you had the, the, the basic note, you had an overprint with the colored denomination. Uh, and um, so it, it, was, it was not, they would not be hand stamped, they would be printed by the printer before they were sent out to uh, as issued notes. Mm -hmm. okay. And, and the notes uh, that I have in my collection that were 1859 to 1865, so a very similar period to um, yes. what you're talking about. Thank you. No, thank you. Th thanks, Ronald. That's very interesting. Right. Okay, over to you, um, Fab. Oh. Kevin, I've got nothing else to say. I'm going to put myself on mute in case I'm tempted to keep talking. Right. Guys, if anyone has questions, please unmute yourself and ask. I have a question regarding coat of arms. I, I'm quite curious about the camels uh, because I've seen similar uh, coat of arms coming from British printers, um, more, I think, Algerian perhaps uh i'm not sure uh so I, I threw it open there for the uh coat of arms questions with the camels yes this is quite interesting unless they were making it generally for the commonwealth and not for ceylon in particular virginia hewitt made a big issue about this camel in her article And yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask this question about this uh, upside down N in my watermark. Is that uh, uncommon or is that uh, just a standard mis possible mistake when they laid out the watermark? Hi, Kevin. I would, I would imagine it's a, just a genuine accident when the person's making up the, the plates. This obviously was a period of time when many people were illiterate. And although they were paper makers, the person making the the board up to to make up the watermark might well have not have just noticed. And one of the unfortunate things is because these notes are very old, a lot of people won't look for that sort of thing to see if there's an error in it. Um, it's not 
standard error. Um, it's just a mistake by somebody who probably had the regular job, a bit tired, but, you know, just put it in upside down and made the mistake. And then later on, it was noted. Um, but uh, Incorrect. Not, everybody, not everybody was uh, as literate as others, so unfortunately. So it would have been corrected, and that's why some of the notes have it correct. Okay, interesting. Uh, Kavan, interestingly, I have in my collection the note consecutive to yours, and uh, it also has the backward uh, N. Okay, uh, it is okay, fine. I like to know what the serial number is. Maybe we should <laughs> collect up the serial numbers which has it correct way and with wrong way, and we might find out when it changed over. <laughs> It would be fun to have two consecutive with right and wrong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have a question maybe now um, that I have the uh, mic uh, uh, on forgeries. I have one forgery of, of one of the one of the Oriental Bank, uh, 10 rupees. Um, is it, were, were there a lot of forgeries at the time? Is it very common to find forgeries among these private banks? I have banks? seen a few. I, I, there is a lot of discussion, I think, in the bank rep, in the records of people who have forged notes. And I have seen a few, one or so, on sale on eBay once, uh, as stamped as a forgery. I don't know how it got out after it was not destroyed. Maybe it's returned to the person after it's stamped. And I have seen one or two among collectors who don't know that it's a forgery, but clearly I can look at it and tell that it's a forgery. But this, 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 there are not many. Okay. I was saying that the one I have, there's no argument because it has, I think, uh, 20 forgery stamps on it. So there's little argument. Okay, okay, okay. Um, there was a period in time when bank notes that were stamped, overstamped, forged or forgery were returned to um, the owner um, without them being prosecuted or without them being hung. So it might have been that period of time when they actually released them. Now it's illegal to possess forged notes. Uh, I'm not sure whether it is illegal to offer forged notes. I'm not technically sure whether it's illegal to possess it in your collection oh. because I think these things become very valuable after they are out of circulation. Well, te technically it's illegal to own even a white Bernhard forgery, but a precedent was set when DNW held an auction which contained a lifetime collection of Bernhard forgeries. And the Bank of England did not stop that auction from going ahead. And it sort of set a precedent. Uh, prior okay. to that, someone like us would not have said, we're selling a forgery. You just had to say it was a, a German five pound. <clears throat> but <laughs> after the auction, we then said <clears throat> it was allowed. Um, <clears throat> we wouldn't be stopped and therefore, we started to sell Bernhard forgeries, obviously as forgeries, and um, <clears throat> maintain a, an updated web website on, a, on our website of numbers that we see, which we add to constantly. Interesting. You is, you in Australia. Sorry, Fabrizio? You, you've been risking to be sent to Australia selling uh, Bernhard forgeries. I've been mean, what's sent to Australia. Sent to Australia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I went there, they let me back home. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Yes. Yes, this is the note that also has the cameras. And these are the notes I love to know who has them because Virginia didn't have them uh, in the British Museum collection, and I have no idea where they are at the moment. They were not sold at that auction. This five pound was not sold at that auction. And I don't know what happened to that auction either. It was one of the rare auctions that went up to about to be started and then was cancelled. So does anybody have information about what happened to that auction? We, we, 
Caban, we think that the owner of the banknotes for that particular auction withdrew his permission to sell them uh, basically the day before. I think that happened with that um, that particular auction. And that was at Sphinx, would I be correct? Sphinx, yeah. I don't think it was the day before because I was watching it online and it went past the time. They delayed the time and about half an hour after it was supposed to start, they made the announcement that it was cancelled. So yes, that, that, that was um, solicitors going backwards and forwards, but the owner withdrew the auction, withdrew his permission to sell them. But it cost um, Spink a lot of money to produce the catalogue, send the catalogue out. People, I think, were turning up for the auction, etc. And then he pulled the plug. And no, I can't say who it is. Okay. <laughs> I, I actually, I was so excited about that auction that I, in fact, spoke to the governor of the central bank. And he sent two representatives to try to bid and win on that auction. And I was so sad when it got cancelled. And I don't know what happened to those notes. It, whether it was bought by somebody else and went somewhere else because it has not come on the market. They were not. They were not bought. They were not sold. Okay. okay. When was this? Uh, 2011. Email me. E email me. Okay. Okay. This. This is the. Yeah. This is the auction. Yeah, that's the auction. There's a fabulous collection. A question? I have a British uh, question. Please excuse my ignorance, but uh, what what is the history behind Britannia? I will put it to the experts to tell about that. I am not too sure myself. I knew you'd ask me, and I, I don't know that I actually have an answer. I, I'd probably have to research her. But I think because she sits on the throne or a, a, a chair um, with the shield and the cornucopia of money, um, and her spear, she's the embodiment of everything. I don't want to say Brit 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 British, but Britannia being a worldwide um, thing at the time, the Commonwealth. So she embodies um, everything that we have to offer, i.e. money, security, power, um, things like that. But I, am, I must admit, I've never really looked. Um, uh, I know that she is depicted in many forms um, and sometimes with an olive branch, um, which is peace as well. Um, but obviously, I prefer her a little bit more covered up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, she's, she wasn't a real person. It's not Boadicea, who was a, a, an English queen who fought the Romans. Um, Britannia is just a sort of personification of Britain, so it's it's a, it's basically a sort of she's sort of um, a mythological uh, representation. That's all. But yeah, you see her lots of places around in this country. You see statues of her, and you see um, obviously on the banknotes on the Bank of England notes anyway, um, and, um, and a lot of um, old. Uh, colonial British Commonwealth uh, notes would use Britannia as well. So she's, you know, she certainly got around, but she wasn't a real person. Do Do you know who came up with the concept and the uh, the imagery? I think the Romans. I mean, Britannia was the Roman name for for Britain, I the think, island of Britain. I think, uh, I think it was already on Roman coins. The figures of Britannia appear already on some uh, Roman coins. Uh, yeah, Fab, I think you may be right about that. Um, the answer's I'm sure the answer's on uh, Wikipedia somewhere. Or, or an Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> no. oh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> no, it's Britannica, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs>
Anyway, thank you very much, Kavan. Uh, very interesting. And I have seen your article in the journal as well. Um, I am logging off now. Um, thank you, uh, Fabrizio, for running the event. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I think, I think we can close. And uh, once again, uh, Kavan, thank you very much. I will send you a small certificate. Uh, on behalf of DBNS as a gift uh, for you sharing your knowledge and thank you building uh, uh, this uh, repository of knowledge. Jonathan, I'm working on uh, your presentation you gave recently to the DBNS and I will upload it on YouTube hopefully by next week. And I'm working also on the Hemi uh, African chapter and uploading those presentations given uh, through your chapter, Amy, on um, YouTube as well, so that it will become richer for people to go and listen to what everyone has been saying. Okay, great. Thank when you. Will this, when uh, will this be available as a YouTube video? And would my most like... probably latest uh, next week. Latest okay. next week. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank it was just be, before we disconnect. I was just gonna contribute to the last question I think from Roger that um, Britannia is not the only female representation of a country. There are many others. There's one for Sweden, there's one for Finland, there's one for Russia. So it's, it's many countries use some female figure to represent the embodiment of the country. Just final comment. So does America. So does America. Liberty. Liberty is used in America. Yeah. Yes, and, and France has its uh, representation in, I uh, think, what's her name, Marie? Marie, yeah, yeah. But Marianne apparently was a real person or someone close to what Marianne is. Ah. Anyway, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone, guys. I will close thank the session everyone. now. Thank you. Go goodbye, everybody. See you soon, thank I you. hope. Thank you. Um, bye. Bye. Bye-bye.